Greetings from off world. Some people I like to wear fractal hole on part on glasses, <clears throat> and we'll get to that shortly. But now let me put on my nerd glasses for I am a scientist. And after all, it is the theory that decides what we can observe. I forget who said that. <clears throat> Could have been Einstein or maybe David Sloan Wilson. I always get those two mixed up. Anyway, this talk, thank you for coming by the way, is about Evcult's implications for Evphil. What happens when we combine evolutionary culturology with evolutionary philosophy? What do we get? And by the way, this talk is by me, Velikovsky of Newcastle, apparently. And that little symbol up there, the uh, funny looking question mark combined with the exclamation mark, that is an interrobang. Combine two old things to get a new thing and it works. The universal algorithm for creativity. Anyway, ask Uncle Google interrobang and all will be revealed. Next. So an outline of this PowerPoint talk, I'm going to talk about three things. First of all, what is the new meta science of evolutionary culturology? Secondly, what is evolutionary philosophy? And thirdly, what are the implications of Ev cult for Ev Phil? So evolutionary culturology is a new meta meta science not just one but two levels above normal sciences <clears throat> it is a scientific all disciplinary matrix it applies to all domains of knowledge and it provides humanity with a single standard universal one size fits all set of scientific units levels evolutionary algorithms also known as evolutionary mechanisms and three laws of all biology and culture so that's what that is and using the new meta meta science of evolutionary culturology we are now able to build an ethicizer an AI supercomputer that monitors the ethics of every fractal whole on parton on earth but we'll get to that later there's a link down the bottom on the evcult blog about a proposal for ensuring a whole earth ethic very influenced by the great work of David Sloan Wilson as it happens moving right along oh yeah so the point is now that we have evolutionary culturology with its units levels mechanisms and three laws we are now able to create the ethicizer and that has implications for philosophy including the is ought divide anyway we'll get to that so what is evolutionary philosophy in a nutshell well, some examples are the great book Evolutionary Philosophy by the great Ed Gibney, 2012, and Ed's weblog, Evolutionary Philosophy, evphil.com. Uh, another great book by the great Dan Dennett is Darwin's Dangerous Idea from 1995. That's a perfect example of evolutionary philosophy as well, and the universal acid of evolution, as Dan calls it. And so... Evphil is a domain of philosophy informed by evolutionary science. If you want a one word definition. And uh, some other examples include scholars and philosophers and scientists such as Ed Wilson, David Sloan Wilson, Natalie Gontier, Mike Brady, Michael Roos, and many, many more 
see a blog post I wrote on towards a Wikipedia page on evolutionary philosophy. Just a few suggestions. Uh, we really should have a Wikipedia page for evolutionary philosophy. I know it would have really helped me when I did my PhD in 2016 uh, to be able to quickly see an outline of the field uh, and then go ahead and read all those great books. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, some philosophical questions in the new light of the new meta-meta science of evolutionary culturology. Uh, it sheds light on the mystery of consciousness, see fractal whole horn partons, which we'll get to soon. Uh, on the question of atomism, <laughs> uh, is the universe made of singular particles? Are cells and organisms and superorganisms and the biosphere and atoms and molecules and other things all made in the same way? Do they all share the same structure and three laws? I think so. Uh, anyway, we'll get to that. So, atomism isn't quite the w right word. It's more a case of there is nothing but fractal holorn partons and the void, as opposed to Democritus's suggestion, there is nothing but atoms and the void. Anyway, other questions sort of raised by Ev Colt. The question of universals, again, see fractal holorn partons and the three laws, which we're about to get to soon. Uh, another great question, is the ethicizer Rocco's Basilisk? Ooh, scary. Um, ask Uncle Google about Rocco's Basilisk. It's a thought experiment, which are always good in philosophy. Uh, and the question is, how do we create the ethicizer without it being Rocco's Basilisk? Or should it maybe be Rocco's Basilisk? A good philosophical question for endless debate. Well, hopefully a debate that would end uh, eventually. Next, so see also though the list of unsolved problems in philosophy on Wikipedia. There's a web page on that. There'll probably be a link in the description of this YouTube video below. My microphone is still on, that's good. And examine each of those problems in the new scientific light of the new meta-meta science of Ev Cult. Next. Oh yeah, and there's a link to a web page for more information. Implications of Ev Cult on Ev Phil. Next. Uh, some philosophical questions that are solved by the ethicizer, which, as I mentioned, is enabled by the new meta meta science of Ev Cult. Here they are. The problem of suffering. Well, the ethicizer is designed to end all suffering. So this is a kind of reverse utilitarianism where not the greatest good for the greatest number. What we're trying to do is the least suffering for the greatest number. So it's coming at it from the bottom rather than the top. Um, yeah, so the problem of suffering is always a good one. And of course, Buddhism has a few answers to that. It's an interesting philosophy rather than a religion. Uh, Anyway, next, the problem of evil. Again, the ethicizer is designed to end all evil worldwide. <laughs> um, yeah, let's not get caught up in this now. Let's just have a quick skim as an outline. The ideal state, going back to Plato's Republic, etc., and Thomas More's Utopia and H.G. Wells' as a modern utopia, etc., etc. Well, the ethicizer is designed to run the ideal state, namely a global utopia on Earth. Next, the question of utopia. Is it possible to have one? Well, again, the ethicizer is designed to bring about utopia on Earth. Uh, the question of directed biocultural evolution, as the great Ed Wilson used to talk about before he sadly passed. Uh, the ethicizer is also designed to handle this, directed biocultural evolution. So rather than leave it to natural selection, should we do artificial or intentional or methodical selection and decide which way we want the future to go for biology, culture, etc. Uh, the ethicizer is designed to handle that one. Show us, it'll show us the best way to go because it shows all, it simulates all possibilities, all possible futures of Earth and 
its inhabitants and then it can guide us there or take us there rather like a GPS route planner uh, on a self-driving bus or an autopilot that lands a plane. I mean, would you really trust a pilot who might be drunk or tired or going through a divorce to land the plane when a computer could do it so much better and more safely? And yes, every now and then they do go a bit wrong, but when compared to us error-prone cybernetic organisms, namely humans or human animals, as I like to call us, um, it still has a better record. It's just uh, computers can be more accurate at certain things than humans currently can. Anyway, uh, directed by a cultural evolution, that's another big philosophical question. How should we shape biology and how should we shape culture and bioculture? Uh, the simulation argument by the great Nick Bostrom. Uh, the ethicizer actually answers this question when you build it, it turns it into an empirical scientific question because if the ethicizer can simulate this earth and this universe and possibly other universes, namely billions of them, using a quantum computer, say, then we are probably in one. And I do emphasize probably. Um, anyway, that answers the sim argument. If you build an ethicizer, um, if you run it backwards, it's an ancestor simulator. Uh, anyway, be all that as it may, let's not get too deep into the details. And one more, the many worlds theory of the great Hugh Everett III from the 50s. Great PhD, if you ever had a chance to read it. Uh, the ethicizer will show empirically if this is true, because it's actually the best way to design the ethicizer. What you want is that every quantum tick, every small interval of time to split every possible decision into a yes or a no, a do or a don't. So when somebody's deciding, should I go to the gym? Let's simulate a world where they do go to the gym and do a workout, good for them. Or, and, sorry, and also the world where they didn't go to the gym that day. Now maybe they went to the gym but got run over on the way back or fell off their bike because their arms were tired from a workout like Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was 18. Who knows? Anyway, what you need to do is simulate all these branching, forking paths, as Borges might say, uh, and show splitting off like evolution kind of does, like a tree. Uh, what happens if we do this decision and what happens if we don't do that choice that way? Uh, and that way we can then compare the simulations. Anyway, the point being, when it comes to designing the ethicizer, you basically need to design it like using, like many worlds theory, using the principles that Hugh Everett III came up with, which unfortunately the Copenhagen interpretation ignored. Uh, that may have been political, but I am of the opinion that uh, Hugh was probably right. This particular universe probably uh, works that way many worlds theory way where you have copies um, branching off at all possible times and the people in those different universes don't notice the branching they just think they're in one universe they don't see the other copies being made by the system sort of pay no attention to the man behind the curtain kind of thing in the wizard of oz anyway these are some philosophical questions that uh, make me scratch my head um, and maybe you too. So have at it. Um, enjoy. Next. Ah, this is interesting. Well, I think so. That introduction or summary was a fractal hole on parton because this talk goes on for quite a bit longer. But if you wanted, you could cut out now and you get the gist because that was an introduction. So that was the outline. Um, like a table of contents, say. So we're going to talk about three things, EvCult, EvPhil, and the implications of EvCult for EvPhil. So do you see how the smaller ellipse here, the outline, is kind of the same as the bigger ellipse, which is the whole thing, yet one is inside the other. So the outline is a part of this whole talk, but the outline was a whole unit as well because you could stop watching right now and never watch the rest of this. Uh, you have free will. You can do whatever you like, um, probably. And now, 
so see how that's fractal the it's self similar on different size scales so we have the outline and then we have the whole talk with the outline inside it so you are here we've finished the outline now we're analyzing the outline as a fractal whole on parton I'll explain that term soon and then we'll have for the rest of this talk the details all expanded out at great length hopefully it won't take too long and then we'll have a quick recap a slide at the end saying what we just covered those three things evcult evfil implications of evcult for evfil anyway so see how that's a fractal whole on parton the smaller things are like the bigger thing they're kind of the same shape geometrically but in other terms too the content of the outline is the same as the content of the whole thing so that's an introduction to fractal whole on partons we're doing f cult already whole part relationships fractal whole on partons anyway see how easy that was we're already doing f cult next so once again this is a bit repetitive but why not uh, what is f cult what is f fill what's the implications of f cult for f fill and now a quote from the great dan dennett in the atlantic online magazine 1998 uh, in the beginning it was all philosophy aristotle whether he was doing astronomy physiology psychology physics chemistry or mathematics it was all the same it was philosophy over the centuries dot 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 i cut a bit out questions empirical scientific questions drop out of philosophy and become science so mathematics astronomy physics chemistry biology they all started out in philosophy and when they got clear they were kicked out of the nest uh, philosophy is the mother and these the sciences are the offspring what a beautiful thing gotta love how dan thinks that was from the atlantic and see also the tree of culture from evolutionary culturology there's a web link there uh, what i did i went through and researched what was the year that each discipline or domain had their first international conference for that many disciplines or domains of knowledge so starting down the bottom we have the roots with aristotle of the tree of culture where everything is philosophy and science is all mixed in but then you have an independent branch of scholars will have their first international conference and you could sort of use that as the moment when that domain emerged as a discrete unit and so we go through there noting when did uh, physics and chemistry and medicine and systems science and big history and cultural evolution etc when did all these different branches have their first international conference uh, mathematics was a good one um, good old hilbert's 23 problems he uh, made a list of 20 three unsolved problems in maths and over the next century a lot of people solved them in the domain of mathematics and got the fields medal for some of them which is the big prize in maths anyway um, the tree of culture that sort of shows how philosophy are the roots down the bottom in the earth and in the soil and out of that springs and branches off these different branches of knowledge and they do branch in different directions but it'd be nice if they all were united again uh, consilience the unity of knowledge that's what ev cult is about we'll get to that soon anyway the tree of culture thank you Krober Alfred Krober did a good tree of culture years ago um, anthropology anyway next wait who is this guy Who's Velikovsky of Newcastle anyway? Is he a system scientist? Some people say he is. Uh, he was also a video game designer for 40 years. There's some games over there that I designed and wrote, but whatever. Uh, some call me a system scientist. Some call me an information scientist uh, because one thing I have 
a chapter in the Encyclopedia of Information Science and Technology in 2017. So, yeah. Uh, or am I a communication scientist? Because information science and communication science are pretty much the same thing. I have a communication PhD. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, am I a computer scientist? My first academic publication co-authored was in the domain of computer science in 2005. It was an augmented reality game system that we invented and in games called A-Rage. Anyway, uh, been programming computers since I was seven years old, like making games since I was a kid, um, video games and board games, other games. Uh, anyway, what am I? Systems, information, communication, computer scientist. Am I a creativity scientist? My PhD was on creativity and cultural evolution in the domain of cinema. Cinema. Movies, films, film movies. Uh, I also have an article in the Journal of Genius and Eminence, which is extreme or category five creativity. Uh, genius. Uh, and I have a chapter in the 2020 Encyclopedia of Creativity. So, uh, and my PhD was a study of empirical study of 40 films, feature films. So, uh, am I, a, what kind of scientist am I? Am I all those five things at once? Yes, maybe so. Uh, am I a transmedia expert because I published with a co-author, a definition of non-fiction transmedia in a journal called Convergence in 2017. And I've worked in the creative industries uh, for 20 years. So films, games, television, novels, uh, etc., graphic design, you name it. Uh, yeah, anyway, and worked on a lot of transmedia projects. Uh, a transmedia story universe is a fractal whole on part on by the way because it's made up of the film and the game and the novel and the website etc uh, let's not get caught up in that now anyway if you do all those things what do you call yourself well i also invented a new science called evolutionary culturology so i just call myself evolutionary culturologist rather than list out those things because it saves a lot of time next oh yeah so if he's an ev cultist an evolutionary culturologist. Uh, he's also the discoverer of the meta meta science of evolutionary culturology. And for more details, see his CV or multimedia showreel. There'll be a link in the description below. Anyway, I hate talking about myself. It's boring. I was there the whole time. Anyway, next. Oh, <laughs> one other way to explain me is uh, look at my email auto signature. That's my sort of public facing list of things anyway you can freeze the video and read all that to me it seems boring next who are velikovsky of newcastle's favorite philosophers huh. well if i have to pick just three because we're short of time uh, i like Irvin laszlo's introduction to systems philosophy systems philosophy includes evolution because Evolution occurs in systems, in ecosystems. So if you get a good handle on systems science, systems philosophy, systems thinking, it's a lot easier to understand evolution. And ecosystems, whether they're biological, cultural ecosystems or biocultural ecosystems. Uh, so I like Irvin Laszlo's systems philosophy, the best of all. That's kind of the all-encompassing view I like the best. I also like Karl Popper pretty much everything he wrote. And I like Arthur Kusler as well. He managed to, like I aim to do, walk to stride the two cultures, the sciences and the arts. So he wrote novels and he also wrote scientific texts. Uh, so those are my three favorite philosophers, probably if I had to pick them. Uh, and they're all incredibly evolutionary philosophers and sometimes scientists as well. Next, uh, what's my favorite film philosophers? If I have to pick three, Stanley Kubrick, everything except Spartacus probably. Uh, 2001's a great one for evolutionary philosophy and futurology. Uh, Terence Malick, uh, The Thin Red Line is a particular favorite. Uh, great philosophy in that film. I also was a volunteer rural firefighter for a while till I took an arrow to the knee. 
So uh, I have an interesting relationship with war films because as a firefighter, the enemy you're fighting is usually a big fire. Anyway, next. Uh, I also like Paul Schrader, uh, transcendental style in film. The films of Ozu, Bresson and Dreyer is a great master's thesis that Schrader wrote. I also highly recommend Schrader on Schrader, a series of interviews that uh, Schrader did. Anyway, those are some of my favourite film or movie philosophers for what it's worth. Next. Who are my favourite scientists? If I have to pick three, Charles Darwin. I had an article on Darwin in the Journal of Genius and Eminence in 2018 in the special issue on Joseph Campbell. Uh, I also believe all life is problem solving, as Popo said, and with life emerges values. And I think the hero's journey can be seen as the scientific method. Don't get me started on that. Anyway, there's blog posts I've, and articles I've written on that. Uh, I like Isaac Newton. I highly recommend James Gleick's short biography of Newton. I also recommend Everything by James Gleick. He's a fantastic pop science writer. Uh, Chaos, Inventing a New Science was very influential on me in the mid-90s, early 90s. Uh, a great introduction to information science and communication science is James Gleick's fantastic book. I think from 2011, called The Information, uh, History, A Theory, of Flood, if that's the right title. Um, great book. Um, and, but my favourite scientist probably is Claude Shannon. Um, great book by Sony and Goodman, A Mind at Play, how Claude Shannon invented the information age, and now we have computers, which I'm talking to you on now, and you're probably watching this on YouTube. So thank you, Claude Shannon. Well done, sir. Um, great book. Um, the authors reached out to me because they knew I'm a systems scientist and recommended it. And uh, I loved it. Great book. Anyway, that's a bit about me. If it helps, maybe it doesn't. I say trust the science, not the scientist. So I'm kind of irrelevant. Much more important is the information that I'm imparting, just in my view. Anyway, next. Uh, by the way, what's the general creativity algorithm or general creativity process or recipe or stage model, as they call it in creativity science? And this applies across science, the arts, music, invention, all domains in culture. When you're doing creative, namely new, useful and surprising work, that's the three-part official definition of creativity in creativity science. Thank you, Dean Keith Simonton and Margaret Bowden and... Bruna, Jerome Bruna and others in creativity science uh, for that three-part definition of a creative unit of culture, something that's new, useful and surprising. Uh, here's the eight-step algorithm uh, to do something creative, namely new, useful and surprising or solve a problem. You've got to first find the problem, acquire the knowledge, gather the related information, incubate it, think about it for a while, let your subconscious do a bit of work maybe. Uh, generate ideas, combine ideas, select the very best idea, that's blind variation and selective retention, which is one of the evolutionary algorithms. So yeah, select that best idea out of all the solutions, which ideally solves the problem. And then last part, number eight, externalize the idea. So you've got to communicate it to other human beings. And we're all error-prone cybernetic organisms, so there's a lot can go wrong in that process because message received does not always equal message sent. Anyway, that's from a fantastic book by R.K. Sawyer, 2012, second edition of Explaining Creativity, which is basically the textbook on creativity science. So highly recommended, Explaining Creativity by R. Keith Sawyer, 2012, second edition. It also has a section on screenwriting as well, if you like that kind of thing. Next. Oh, yeah. Sorry, this is where we're up to. I'm now externalizing this idea of Ev Cult and the fractal holon part on structure of culture and the three laws, etc. So just putting it all out there and feel free to ignore it if you wish. Next. 
Oh, by the way, that creativity algorithm uh, equates to the 12 steps of creative practice theory, which is a thing I came up with during my PhD. Uh, those are the 12 steps you have to go through in any cultural domain, whether it's novels or science, music, um, engineering, anything really. Um, 12 steps to go through um, in terms of general creativity. Next. Oh, and by the way, it's a combination of Csikszentmihalyi's and Pierre Bourdieu's uh, models and theories. Uh, but that's where we get into the Newcastle School of Creativity, which combines Csikszentmihalyi and Bourdieu. Uh, it's all in my PhD, which is free to read online if you want more information on that. Next. What have we here? What is evolutionary culturology? Ah, we've finally got there. Okay, so what is it? Well, here's a pop quiz. How many units can you count here? How many thin black squares there? Um, what about here? How many black squares? The outline of a square, I mean. And how many units of culture here? Is there one word? Is there four letters? Who knows? Anyway, I'll give you time to think about that. And moving right along. This is how many I count. So there's five units on the bottom left. 25 there and five units there because it's one word but it's also four letters. So there's five units in total. So what we just did was counting on different scale or size levels. Um, so that's how many scales we looked at. With the first square there with five units, there's one big square and then there's four little squares inside it. So those are two scales, big and little. Uh, then there's 25 there because you've got to count the three by three squares as well. And over there, there's five units. If we only count two levels, the level of the letter, four letters in, a, in that word, and one word. So that's four plus one is five units. So four on the level of the letter and one unit on the level of the word. So we're already doing evcult, but the question is how many scales do you want to count? I say we count them all, and that's what the exercise is for as well, later. Anyway, next. So Evcult is a gestalt switch, or a gestalt switch, uh, provided that you understand it, of course. Um, what do we see here? Do we see a duck or a rabbit? Or do we see a duck, a rabbit, and a duck rabbit, which would be three things. So this applies to the Necker cube as well. So it's a new way of seeing things or different levels and layers that were under our nose all along but now we're kind of awake to and aware of them with the tools of Evcult looking at different fractal whole on partons, different units of culture on different levels, scale levels and minding the three laws. Next. Oh, just a book I highly recommend, Darwin on Man, a psychological study of Darwin's creativity by Gruber. A great creativity science example there. Shows how Darwin moved through the metaphors of the coral of life and then the tree of life and finally the tangle bank, uh, which now he's getting into ecosystems and systems theory, you see. See why systems theory is important? Systems science and systems philosophy. Anyway, that, that's also fractal, that picture, because there's a little guy in the mind of the bigger guy there on the book cover. Anyway, speaking of metaphors, this is a great book in my view. The Tangle Bank, Darwin, Marx, Fraser and Freud as imaginative writers. Stanley Edgar Hyman examined their writing for the metaphors, so how did they get across their ideas? So Darwin, you know, used the, the coral of life, the tree of life, the web of life, the tangled bank, 
Uh, Marx used a lot of stagecraft metaphors like a magician or a uh, someone pulling the wool over your eyes with false consciousness and hegemony. Uh, James Fraser used a lot of travelogue metaphors, uh, going through a dark forest. Uh, Freud used um, sort of hydraulic metaphors, so pressure builds up in the uh, unconscious and comes out one way or another in the conscious, etc. Anyway, Hyman goes through and looks at uh, the metaphors these guys used, and it's interesting just from the point of view of communication. Sometimes the metaphor you choose really helps get the message across, and sometimes you pick the wrong metaphor and everyone just goes, huh? Anyway, as I say, that is a fractal because that picture there has a little thing that's very similar to the bigger thing. It looks a bit like a Cartesian theatre to me, but uh, it's actually a fractal whole and parton because the brain is structured as a fractal whole and parton and so is the body, the organism. Anyway, let's not get too deep into this now. Next. What do we got here? Oh yeah, an empirical scientific question is how many discrete units of culture in this phrase inside the white box? Let's do ev cult on the word ev cult, the phrase ev cult rather. Next. Anyway, count them if you like. Is it two words or is it one phrase or is it lots of letters? And what about morphemes and syllables if you say it out loud? Anyway, count those if you like pop quiz. Next. This is one way to break them up. So the letters, the, that scale level of the letters, and then parts of words, and then words, and then the whole phrase. So let's do that slowly. Oh, and we're now counting discrete units on different scale or size levels of culture. So this is symbolic culture, language, glyphs, written symbols. Anyway, that's what Ev Cult's about, but it applies to all domains in culture, music, movies, science, everything, philosophy, religion, you name it, ideas, processes, products. Uh, let's have a, a slow look at counting those units. So we have letter, that's one unit. And you could count all the letters in that top word, evolutionary there. Then we have a morpheme, evo, evolutionary, ever. Uh, that's a part, so it's a morpheme or a syllable, evo, evolutionary. And then we have the whole word. And likewise, down the bottom, we have the letter C on the level of words. One, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. One, uh, 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 I love to count. <coughs> anyway, uh, so we have letters and then moving up in scale, we have morphemes or parts of words. Uh, although cult <laughs> by itself due to polysemy or different meanings of different words is a word on its own. <laughs> but ev cult isn't a cult unless you want it to be. I mean, you can turn science into a religion and frankly, I think that's a good idea. But anyway, that's a job for the ethicizer. Uh, and then we have the whole word, but of course those two units, evolutionary culturology, two words, are also one phrase, so that's a unit as well. So we're, we're changing scale and size levels here. Um, yeah, that's evcult. What's this? Evcult is a new meta-meta science, a scientific all-disciplinary matrix that provides humanity with a single standard universal one size fits all set of scientific, see, I'm wearing a white lab coat. I have a sign here that says evolutionary culturologist and uh, wearing nerd glasses. I just I look like a scientist, so it must be science. Surely you can judge a book by its cover or not. Uh, most things are ironic. They're the opposite to what they appear on the outside. Anyway, it's a single standard universal one size fits all set of scientific units, levels, evolutionary <laughs> algorithms or evolutionary mechanisms and three laws of all culture and biology. By the way, it's laws of physics and chemistry, sociology and all sorts, but let's just keep it to two for now. 
for a start. This is a lot to take in. Next, that's what EvCult is in one page. Uh, it's a synthesis of six other meta sciences. So, for example, information and communication science, also system science, also evolutionary algorithms, also creativity science, which started around 1950 with J.P. Guilford's speech to the American Psychological Association, and cultural evolution and applied evolutionary epistemology, and it came out of the Newcastle School of Creativity in Australia, and that's Ev Cult. And there's a tiny bit of memetics in there, but not too much, because in my view, memetics makes the mistake of giving units of culture agency. Uh, systems have agency because they have goals, but units of culture, which are the inputs and outputs of systems, uh, are just tools. They don't have intentional agency, Anyway, let's forge ahead. Onward, atheist soldiers, I say. Oops, did I say that out loud? Next. Uh, yeah, so what's the difference between a science, a meta science, and then a meta meta science? Well, down the bottom, you have your individual sciences, such as maths, fractal geometry, physics, chemistry. Astronomy, geology, biology, psychology, sociology, anthropology. That's an emergent uh, diagram, by the way. So once you have maths and computers, you can simulate um, physics, build a universe. And then within that, you're going to have astronomy, planets and stars and things, and geology, because they have physical details and then you can get chemistry you know physics chemistry comes out of that when hydrogen atoms bond to form helium etc and then if on a planet life emerges you can get biology and biology has an algorithm inside it deciding what to do uh, that's psychology and then you get sociology when you have groups of living organisms and then anthropology is you know, cultures and stuff. Anyway, that's down the bottom of the individual sciences. So that's there. You know, physics only covers so much. Chemistry has some disciplinary boundaries, shall we say. Uh, biology, etc., etc. Um, but then you have meta sciences, which is a level above because system science applies to all those things because. Things in physics, such as atoms and planets and solar systems, are, you know, galaxies, universes, their systems. Um, in chemistry, you have molecules and compounds, they're also systems. Uh, then you have, you know, your biology, well, that's an organic system, a life form. And then you get psychology, you know, which there are systems inside a psychology. And sociology, you have systems because you have groups, etc. Um, so system science is a meta science. It applies to more than one science. Um, and so too with information and communication science. So atoms, molecules, viruses, animals, plants, people, they communicate. They send signals and messages and exchange information, etc. So information and communication science applies to all the sciences. It's a meta science. And then over on the right, we have cultural evolution. So that studies the evolution of units of culture. And, um, you know, see books by Alex Masudi and Boyd and Richardson and etc. etc. And creativity science, you know, Dean Keith Simonton, Chicksent Mahai, R. Keith Sawyer, the Newcastle School of Creativity, etc. Anyway, those are meta sciences, but this one, evolutionary culturology, it goes a level above because it reduces systems and units of culture to fractal, whole, and partons. So it's an act of scientific reduction. Um, things are made of information, matter, and energy. That's what systems are made of, and that's what they process as well. So you can reduce both systems and units of culture to fractal whole on partons and the three laws. Uh, so it's, I call it simplicity science, really. It uh, makes everything a lot simpler to understand. Next, 
So Evcult is simplicity science. Uh, by the way, here's a quote, a random quote from a random web page. Stephen Hawking is credited with characterising the 21st century as an era when humanity would grapple with complex science. It's kind of just, you know, what's left to discover or what's left to solve, the puzzles or the problems. Uh, but ra my PhD was in systems and complexity science and evolution, but uh, out of that came this discovery. Uh, the units, levels, mechanisms, and three laws. Uh, I like to think of it as simplicity science because it just makes things easier and simpler. Uh, and that's a quote from a web page that I found thanks to David Sloan Wilson. Anyway, Evcult is simplicity science. Sounds a lot easier to handle than complexity science too. Next. Okay, so over the years, sorry, what are these things? This is a quick pop quiz. What do those symbols represent? Those eight things. Thinking music. Da, 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 da. Anyway, um, those are eight things, but I say they're all fractal holon partons. Uh, what they are is an atom, then a molecule, a tectonic plate, a solar system, a cell, a chunk, which is a part of a memory, you know, something, information in your brain, stored in memory in your brain. A bit, you know, thank you, Claude Shannon. Information, yes or no, off or on, zero or one. Um, and a system, which is just something that has a boundary, inputs and outputs and an algorithm inside it. Anyway, these are all fractal whole and partons. They're all the same thing. So even a chunk of information in your brain is a fractal whole on parton. So this is where information and communication science comes in. So those things are all fractal whole on partons governed by the three laws of fractal whole on partons. Next. Oh yeah, so they're all that, just that. That, by the way, is a drawing suggested by Leibniz uh, around 1666. Um, it has enormous mathematical implications and it's a great indication or symbolic metaphor uh, for what a fractal whole on parton is. It is a whole and a part at the same time. It is a whole unit, and but it is a part of a larger unit, and it obeys the three laws. Anyway, next. By the way, Evcult solves 50 or more hard scientific problems of culture. There's a web page with those 50 quotes, those problems that it solves, if you like reading problems and then have cults suggested solution now that we have these discoveries the units levels mechanisms and three laws next uh, this is a little video that i made in sketchup just to show the vertical integration of the sciences that results So these domains emerge out of each other. And these domains are all fractal whole on partons. So that's consilience, the unity of science or vertical integration. Good old Ed Wilson, 1998. So that's that. Yeah. Three laws of fractal whole on partons. Integrate up, compete and cooperate sideways, control and command, or enable agency and structure downwards. The smaller units which are inside them. Next, so, sorry, by the way, not all hierarchies are holarchy partarchies. Important distinction. Next. Okay, wait a minute. What's the difference between evcult and culturology? Well, I call this evolutionary culturology, um, but there was a domain or discipline called culturology which was started up in the 40s, 50s, 60s by Leslie White. There's an example, some examples of his writing on it. There's some good ideas in there, uh, but that's distinct from evcult. Uh, this is a whole new bag, uh, but borrowing and using some of his excellent ideas. 
but it's not really like I actually discovered his work after I had done my discoveries so if there's any overlaps it's just convergence um, in the same way you know scientific multiples happen a lot like Leibniz and Newton solving calculus, Wallace and Darwin solving evolution. Dean Keith Simonton has a great book from 2004, Creativity in Science, where he has a huge long list of scientific multiple discovery. Anyway, uh, unfortunately, good old Leslie White, his culturology as a discipline or domain was sort of mostly forgotten or ignored these days, from what I can see, but there was an issue that he decided you shouldn't have a school so whenever a school like Plato's Academy of his work started up, he did everything he could to disband it. He said, trust the work, not the workers kind of thing. So yeah, anyway, just a big distinction between evolutionary culturology and culturology. So if you say, oh, in culturology, blah, blah, I'll think you're talking about Leslie White. But if you say in evolutionary culturology or in ev cult, blah, blah, I'll know you're talking about this stuff that I'm talking about. Good. Next. Good to clear that one up. Another finer point of distinction there. So, Ev Cult solves consilience as per Ed Wilson's great book, Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge, because it applies to all domains in culture and biology, uh, because its units, levels, evolutionary algorithms, and three laws apply to all those domains so there you go simplicity science scientific reduction next oh, yeah they're all fractal whole and partons for their units or their canonical units at any rate not the archive ones next what is culture this is what Cult suggests just three things, ideas, processes, and products. That's pretty straightforward. You can split products into two types. Sorry, you can split processes into mental processes, which is thinking and emotions, etc., and physical processes, which is separate to a person thinking. So think of a self-driving car. Uh, that's a physical process. Or an oven with a timer. That's a physical process that doesn't necessarily have a person thinking involved in that system, although a thinking person may start that system in action. Uh, so yeah, culture is just those three things. There's over 300 definitions of culture floating around there, but uh, Evcult likes to look at it this way because it means everything's a lot simpler and easier to categorize and understand. Next. Yeah. Where does that come from? I got the idea from Popper's Three Worlds Theory, but I also split his world two, or the world of mental processes, thinking and uh, feeling, uh, into uh, mental processes, which is his world two, but also f separate physical processes. And having those four categories, not just three worlds, means um, it's easier to classify units of culture. And some of them are all for. They're an idea, a mental process when you think about that idea, a physical process when you execute the algorithm or bake a cake, say, the idea of baking a cake, thinking about baking that cake, baking that cake in an oven, and then the product might be the cake. Uh, yeah. Anyway, see Popper's Three Worlds for a bit of background on this stuff. Uh, that's a good chapter on it there. That was a speech lecture he gave. And there's more on it in, there's four separate essays in different places, but uh, there's some good discussion of it in the philosophy of Karl Popper, the Schilp volume. And by the way, that's the same book where we have evolutionary epistemology, the chapter by Donald Campbell, which kicked off the domain of evolutionary epistemology proper. Uh, BVSR, blind variation and selective retention applied to knowledge and knowledge processes. And of course, Dean Keith Simonton has done extensive work developing that because Don Campbell was his doctoral grandfather. Anyway, there you go. Next. Oh yeah, and see also, obviously, applied evolutionary epistemology, uh, Natalie Gontier, Mike Brady, etc. Fantastic stuff.
and without which I couldn't have made any of these discoveries. Next. Oh yeah, there's the website for Appeal, Applied Evolutionary Epistemology Lab. Highly recommended. Next. Oh yeah, so what this means is those four categories of culture, ideas, mental processes, physical processes and products are a kind they're a good classification system and it's kind of like the four phase states of water so plasma gas liquid and solid roughly equates to idea mental process physical process product here's a metaphor next Oh yeah, so that means you can go around looking at everything in culture and classifying it. Is it one, two, three, or four, or all of those things at once? And uh, this also means I really like Andy Norman's book, Mental Immunity, and uh, his website, Circe Cognitive Immunology, great non-profit organization doing good work there on people's cognitive immunity. Uh, this means you can scientifically identify and track ideas, processes and products. Um, and cognitive immunity is a good bottom-up process where as people we need to improve our critical thinking and use the new Socratic method in Andy's book. Um, and as a top-down method there's the ethicizer which goes around tagging fake news on any communication media and pointing out why it's untrue and links to better scientific information, etc. So these are just some solutions to solving cultural cancer or bad ideas that aren't pro-social and don't help humanity in general. Uh, next. Yeah, so bottom up and top down causation. Um, you see in the middle there a person or organism. This is one big fractal hole on Parton. So you have the universe or the multiverse full of universes. Um, then we're just zooming down using the three laws, um, planets, continent, country, state, city, local community, family, person, organ system, organism, sorry, organ, <laughs> is it, which is a system, a tissue, a cell, organelle. These are all fractal holon partons and you can use the three laws to identify the next scale level up, which is either a system or a unit of culture or sometimes both. Anyway, so just in terms of curing cultural cancer, the ethicizer is a top-down solution which monitors everything and uh, deals with those problems and a bottom-up approach which is each person doing their own bit to try and uh, keep on the straight and narrow in terms of uh, not propagating bad ideas and supporting good ideas, pro-social ideas. Next, see also pro-social world from David Sloan Wilson and this view of life and the Evolution Institute, etc. Next. So what is the structure of all culture? Here's a hint, it's the same structure as atoms, molecules, cells, organs, organisms, superorganisms, the biosphere and the universe. Yeah, so Ev Cult discovered the structure of all culture is the fractal holon parton. What is a fractal? Well, they're things that are self-similar on different scale levels or different size levels. So there's some examples in fractal geometry. Um, or you could have a circle made of tiny little circles. So the circle is made of little dots, which would be circles. Um, and a branch is fractal because the part looks like the whole, a cloud and, you know, dendritic structure of riverbeds. When you zoom in, a little branch and fork of a river looks like the whole River Delta overall, etc. Uh, great book is Scale by Jeffrey West. Anyway, next. Fractals are things that are self similar on different scale levels. So, not forgetting the Mandelbrot set, etc., Julia set, um, Cantor set, etc. Next. 
Yeah, so this is an example. It's a one made of little ones. See how on the left there we have a big number one made of small ones. That's very literal with fractal holon partons, a one made of ones. So all those smaller ones are obeying the three laws of holon partons. They're integrating upwards into the larger unit, the bigger number one. They're competing and cooperating sideways with each other with units on the same scale level. So they're cooperating to form the big one. Um, and they're all competing for attention, I guess. Um, and then uh, they're controlling and commanding the units inside them. So each number one uh, has to obey the law of looking like a number one symbol. So if any of them look too much like a seven, it would be breaking the rules and wouldn't be properly commanded and controlled to do what it's supposed to do to solve the problem it's addressed to solve. And here's a two made of twos. So again, this is a literal example of a fractal hole on parton. It's a big two made up of little twos. Now, people are made of atoms. <laughs> well, people are made of organ systems, which are made of organs, which are made of tissues, which are made of cells, which are made of organelles, which are made of molecules, organic molecules which are made of atoms. Anyway, they're all fractal whole on partons. They all obey the three laws. Hope that metaphor helps understand what is a fractal whole on parton in Evcult. Next. Uh, yeah, so again, fractals are things that are self-similar on different scale levels. So say you had a book that had four parts or even four chapters in it. Uh, and you're halfway through reading the first chapter there at point A and you're going to read it all the way through to the end. Or it could be an article made up of four sections that are slightly different sizes. Or it could be a movie that's made of four acts. Anyway, the parts resemble the whole, but the parts are holes in themselves. So there's a whole act in a movie. Um, there's a whole chapter in a book. There's a whole section in an article, etc. So these are fractal holon partons. Next. Or, for example, that could be a song. So there could be verses and choruses, which are parts of the song, but then you have the whole song, and maybe you're halfway through listening to the first verse. In that particular model or example, graphical example or model there, this is just trying to show how fractal whole on partons work through time. So when we absorb information, so listening to a song or reading a book or watching a movie or listening to a talk on YouTube like this one, we there are little parts that make up the whole uh, and they obey the three laws of whole on partons because they're three laws of culture and biology. Next. Oh yeah, so just going deeper, I really like the great book by Brian Boyd uh, on the origin of stories from 2009. I cited it a lot in my 2016 PhD thesis study. Uh, here's an example with stories. So Brian notes the pattern in stories is goal. So a character has a goal and then they take action and then there's an obstacle or a problem and then there's the outcome. So you can use that same four part pattern to look to analyze a scene in a movie or a, a novel or a story of any kind, a song, a poem. You can also go to a bit larger and analyze a sequence of scenes. So maybe there's a chase scene in a James Bond story or novel or film, and maybe it uses three different locations. Maybe they charge down the back streets and then they go across a different bridge and then they head out into the desert. That is all that sequence of chase scenes is a chase sequence, but it's also structured goal, action, obstacle, outcome for the protagonist, James Bond say. And then you have the entire story, which also has the same structure of goal, maybe stop the supervillains, action, well, go to their lair and try and uh, arrest them or shoot them, whatever. Uh, obstacle, uh, well, maybe there's booby traps and guards and henchmen. And the outcome, probably James Bond succeeds in eliminating the bad guy. 
so this same fractal structure applies all the way down through stories uh, because when I discovered the unit of culture, the structure of the unit of culture, the fractal holon and parton, stories are just units of culture in any medium, whether it's a song or a poem or a book or a TV show or a movie or an anecdote, etc. So stories or Narims are units of culture. So once you have the structure of the unit of culture, it also solves the problem of what is the unit of story. It is a fractal whole and part on. So anyway, read my PhD thesis for more or maybe my five chapters that I've published since. Moving right along and look at all Brian Boyd's work. It's terrific. He's also writing a biography of Sir Karl Popper. Next. Uh, yeah, so the structure of all culture is the fractal whole on parton. These are three different views of it. There's a top view where you just see one unit, say one movie or one book or one word or one sentence. And then if you flip it upside down and look under the hood, we get the bottom view there and we see all the parts on the different scale levels that make it up that are all obeying the three laws of whole on partons on each scale level. And then you can extract or extrude it or explode it like the third view there like uh, dissecting a frog in biology class in high school you can pull the parts out and look at them one by one and hopefully then reassemble it maybe even combine them with other units and create a whole new great unit because science is analysis but also synthesis putting it all putting the parts back together and doing it better so that's a very key point made in Ed Wilson's consilience book from 1998 which a lot of people overlook they think science is just analysis but they forget it's also synthesis you know providing a better product or solution building a better mousetrap etc next yeah so both systems and units of culture which are not always the same thing but sometimes they are uh, because a car is a system but it's also a unit of culture uh, are structured as fractal holon partons and obey the same three laws. So on the left we've got biology, so we have a biological ecosystem as the big circle or the big system. Within that you've got populations, within that a hollow biont, which is like a person, but we also have lots of viruses and bacteria and things that are a part of the living planet that are on two legs, that is us walking around. So and you need certain healthy bacteria in your gut. So maybe you drink Yakult or something like that to keep healthy. Anyway, yeah, the hollow biont um, and all the bacteria on your skin and that sort of thing. And then cells. Anyway, on the left, that's a whole on parts on a biology. And then on the right, we have culture. So you have cultural ecosystem within that one domain in culture and there's about 50,000 of them, is language, but there's other domains like music, science, and visual art, and there's subdomains. So within visual art, there's films, and there's painting, and there's drawing, and etc. And then, you know, just going down the left, we have language, smaller unit, sentence, smaller unit, word. Anyway, this is meant to show clearly that biology and culture are structured scientifically the same way the units the discrete units are fractal whole on partons so just look for things using a uh, magnifying glass look for things that obey the three laws all at once so they integrate upwards into a larger unit they compete and com uh, <laughs> cooperate with units on the same level compete and or cooperate with units on the same level and they control and command units on the level below which are inside them. Anyway, moving right along. Next. Yeah, so that's an important point. Both systems and units of culture are structured as fractal whole on partons. So that's what that diagram is meant to show. So there's some examples. You might have a letter or a word or a sentence going into the system, which is a person, a biological organism, or a physical, chemical, biological, psychological, sociological, cultural system is what a person can be. And 
they might output a unit of culture, so they might speak a sentence themselves later or they might repeat a unit of culture that they heard. Um, and then you have languages or units of music. Maybe somebody hears a song and maybe they also whistle the song or sing the song later or sing it to somebody in a performance. Uh, and with food going into that system, there's different fractal, whole and parton scale levels. You might eat just one Pringle or bigger, you might eat a whole meal, sort of fish and two veg. And then there's a whole diet, the whole everything that you eat, uh, including that bit of chocolate. Anyway, um, and then there's outputs, which in the case of food, the system output is usually poop, but a lot of the energy, matter and information goes into maintaining, growing, repairing the system. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, just an example pointing out that systems and units of culture are both structured the same way, whether they're biological systems or artificial sort of human-made systems. Anyway, that's an interesting point. Next. Yeah, so systems are very simple. It has a boundary which can, and it contains algorithms or processes, systems processes inside it, and it has inputs and outputs. And... Uh, has a goal, whether that goal is just to stay alive or sit down and watch a good movie on Netflix, whatever the goal may be. So systems are structured as fractal whole on partons. Very what are the three laws of all culture? Well, another hint, they're the same laws that govern atoms and molecules and cells and organs and organisms and superorganisms, we're getting bigger all the way, and the biosphere, that's all life on Earth, and the universe. Next. Yeah, these are the three laws. So fractal holon partons, they do three things. They integrate upwards into the bigger unit on the scale level above, and they compete and or cooperate with units on the same scale level and they control and command units on the scale level below which are inside them. So an organ system controls each organ. There's about 20 organ systems in the human body. And then the organ controls its tissues and the tissues control all the cells. So you go all the way down and all the way up. This is upward and downward causation. So these three laws cause upward and downward causation. Uh, which was a big mystery in evolution for a long time. A lot of debate over that one. Anyway, this solves it. Uh, yeah, so those are your three laws, and both systems and units of culture obey those three laws. So, there you go. Next. Yeah, so the three laws of fractal holon partons actually causes multi-level selection to occur. You can do it as a thought experiment or you can make a simulation to demonstrate it. If you have units all on the same level and limited or finite resources, they will eventually compete for the resources. And the solution is cooperate um, or get more resources from somewhere or go somewhere else. Anyway. Uh, unfortunately, when it's finite, it's hard to go somewhere else. So it's hard to get off Earth and go and live on Mars right now. Uh, but there's all sorts of problems up there too. Anyway, so we have here a diagram which from Evcult. You are a system of systems inside more systems. So you're a biological, psychological, sociological, cultural system. But you're also a physical and chemical system because you're made of atoms and molecules. And yeah, you're inside bigger systems. So family, perhaps, local community, town or village, city, state, country, and planet. And we really need a whole earth ethic. Anyway, the point is the three laws operating on units in biology or in culture or physics and chemistry causes multi-level selection. So I think David Sloan Wilson and Ed Wilson are right. And unfortunately, just on this one, I think good old Richard Dawkins is not quite right. But maybe if he sees this one day, he'll the penny will drop.
who knows? I'm a huge fan of Richard Dawkins, just not absolutely everything he ever said. And that goes for all my heroes. I'm huge fans of them, but I may not agree with absolutely everything they ever said. That's critical thinking for you. Next. Uh, yeah, so use the three laws of fractal holon partons like that to look at things and find the units. Just look for things that obey those three laws. That's how you can identify the discrete units. But by the way, things are both discrete and continuous. Um, this comes out of communication theory in the 20s. I won't go into it now. Next. That's a handy little tool from Evcult. Uh, the three laws as a magnifying glass. Uh, you can, or fractal hole on part on colored glasses. You can use it to find discrete units and levels of culture or biology or bioculture because biology has culture in it if culture is ideas, processes and products. Anyway, let's not go there right now. Uh, next. Yeah, so some evolutionary algorithms or mechanisms from Evcult. You've got selection and transmission. So maybe you hear a word and then you tell somebody else that same word like Brangelina or something or Evcult. Who knows? Uh, selection, variation and transmission. So that's you can do that either intentionally where you hear a unit of culture or absorb it or read it and then you change it a little bit. You know how gossip tends to evolve uh, and then transmit it. But you can also do that as a creative act to hear something and then improve it a bit and then transmit it and tell somebody else. What I've done with Popper's Three Worlds, if you ask me, I turned it into four uh, because it's a good classification system for a taxonomy of culture. Next, blind variation and selective retention. This goes to Charles Darwin, um, Don Campbell, Natalie Gontier. This is evolutionary epistemology. Um, Dean Keith Simonton. Yeah, BVSR, that's another evolutionary algorithm. And the ST and SVT take place inside that larger algorithm. There's a diagram over there of the fractal systems meta model of biocultural evolutionary creativity from Evcult or the Fasum of Bekek. <laughs> um, so you have derived from Csikszentmihalyi's sociocultural systems model of creativity. You have up top a domain in culture, whether it's language or music or science or the domain of cars or the domain of microscopes or the domain of things that smell like chocolate whatever. Um, you have a domain in culture and then you have a field of the audience, producers and consumers of that culture. So say we're talking about the domain of novels, you have writers and readers and critics of novels. And within that you have individual people, so a writer like J.K. Rowling or Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or Flann O'Brien. My favourite novel is The Third Policeman by Flann O'Brien. Anyway, that's not important right now. So yeah, you have the socio-cultural systems model of creativity, but I've made it fractal by showing the memory, imagination, judgment system inside a person's head. And then we can add this to AI and have uh, artificial computational creativity where a computer comes up with good ideas and then it has an artificial critic that selects the best ideas and then presents them. Anyway, so you've got the, the fractal systems meta model there and there's another evolutionary algorithm where ideas go through processes to products and vice versa, back the other way. Someone sees a product, thinks about it, has a better idea, how to build a better mousetrap. Here's an example, the old rat, rat sack catch and hold. That's a slightly different twist on a um, better mousetrap. And uh, anyway, more on the Evcult blog next. Yeah, here's another view of that same fractal systems meta model 
of biocultural evolutionary creativity. Up top, you have any domain in culture, language, science, values, uh, ideology, narratives, written fiction, written non-fiction, movies, television, video games, poetry, humour, the domain of humour, all things that are funny, uh, religions, music, visual art, invention, mechanical inventions like cars or microscopes or glasses, what have you, spectacles. Next. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, up top you have your domain and then you have your agent in the bottom right, which could be a person or a robot, and they uh, absorb units of culture from a domain, so they read books or read the internet or something, and then present those ideas to the field for that domain, so the producers and consumers and the critics for that domain and the judges for that domain, uh, the gatekeepers as they're called, and then see if that new unit, if you've created a new one by combining old units, uh, might enter the domain. And in this way we have cumulative cultural evolution where someone takes an old idea and adds something to it and it works better than the competition or the, alter the contemporary alternatives. So that's creativity, creating a new useful and surprising unit of culture, idea, process or product. Anyway, next. And yeah, this is the I iterates to P and back again, evolutionary algorithm. And then you get into information, energy and matter, but let's not go too deep right now. You can read those five chapters and get more. Next. Uh, yeah, so that's all you really need is those two things in EvCult, the units and scale levels, which is the fractal whole on parton, and the three laws of fractal whole on partons, integrate upwards, compete and cooperate sideways, control and command, or if you prefer, enable agency and structure downwards, the units on the scale level below, which are inside them. Next. Yeah, so this gives you the vertical integration or consilience of knowledge. Uh, all those domains from evolutionary systems philosophy, moving up evolutionary philosophy, evolutionary mathematics, evolutionary uh, astronomy and geology, of course, and then evolutionary physics, evolutionary chemistry, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, evolutionary sociology, evolutionary anthropology, evolutionary arts and humanities. These units and these domains are all fractal holon partons. So this unites on the side there, we can see philosophy, science, social science and the arts. So it even turns the arts into a science because you've got the units, levels, evolutionary mechanisms and the three laws to start really empirically examining these units. Where do they come from and where do they go to? Next. Yeah, so some industrial, past industrial applications is, for example, I built the Robo Raconteur, which is an artificially intelligent computer program that combines existing movie ideas and then judges them for a new movie idea. So it's an artificial writer program. It's an Excel spreadsheet you can download and I published an article on it in the International Journal of Art, Culture and Design and Technology. Anyway, it combines top 20 ROI or return on investment movie ideas and it also has an ironic character generator in it and all sorts. But uh, it's computational creativity. Anyway, that came out of my PhD. But that's an example of uh, a World One artifact, um, a product uh, of EvCult. Next. Yeah, and I also did an agent based model of the global film industry. Play to be system. and yourself. So you in NetLogo, I adapted creative. a model by Wilson. And there we have it. Quite messy, really. It like the real world. Um, and if you would like to have a play with how this the film industry yourself, works as a system, all with you inputs need to do and outputs is and algorithms, log. and you have movie screenplays and movies, but only 1% of movie screenplays get made, and of that, 70% of movies lose money. Anyway, 
it's the less than 1% problem, which is the same as uh, evolution on uh, the history of the world because 99% of species have gone extinct over Earth's history and it's pretty much the same in all domains in culture, novels, movies, songs. 99% of culture becomes archive and only less than 1% becomes canon. It's called the rock star effect where some things are bestsellers and everything else sort of fades into obscurity. Anyway, that's evolution for you, but can we fix it? Yes, we can. That's what the ethicizer is for, but we'll get to that later. Anyway, next. Yeah, so I went along to the Computational Creativity Conference last year and talked a bit about a lot of this stuff, Earth Cult and the Robo Raconteur and whatnot. Anyway, uh, this has applications in creativity, computational creativity, so we can get computers to do solve the hard problems for us and we can just do the fun stuff. Next. Oh yeah, I also made a board game called Philosopoly. It's a cross between Trivial Pursuit and Monopoly, but sort of asking questions about philosophy. Trivia questions. So anyway, that's a fun print and play board game that I made to try and get people to enjoy and learn more about philosophy. Anyway. You can print it out and play it if you like. Next. So here's another. <sighs> There's a war on science. <clears throat> Here is another uh, game I designed. Sudden death stress chess. So as you can see, the pieces start in the middle of the board. So that's the start of the game. Also, black has a handicap, one pawn missing. Uh, change the rules and see what happens. It's a really fun game to play and there's a blog post on it there. Anyway, this brings us to agency or rules, sorry, agency or choices and structure or rules. Here, for example, is a standard chess setup. Let's talk about agency and structure. So the structure of the game is the laws or the rules. And the agency are the possible moves or the choices or decisions that either a player can make or if those little pieces had intentional agency, maybe they could make. But they don't because they're just units of culture. So systems have intentional agency Whereas units of culture do have agency, possible moves, but somebody has to move them around <coughs> and do things with them. So this is a crucial part of Evercult and the Newcastle School of Creativity. Uh, agency and structure. So agency, other synonyms for that are choices or decisions or so-called free will and or possible moves as the great Dan Dennett likes to say, possible moves in chess or forced moves in chess. Uh, and on the other hand, we have structure, laws or rules, also known as conventions or traditions or the rules of the game. <clears throat> and some physical laws are pretty hard to get around, but some laws such as laws of democracy or laws of a communist society are hard to get around but only if you get caught. Anyway, uh, agency and structure, very important. It goes all the way through all fractal holon partons. Just not all of them are systems. Not all of them have intentional agency. Next, so think about this. Atoms obey certain laws, including the three laws of fractal holon partons. And uh, Physical laws discovered by Newton and Einstein, etc. And uh, yeah, agency and structure. Molecules also have slightly different agency and structure. So there's a different chessboard there. So some different rules of the game of things they can do or things we can make them do if we're an intentional system. And then again, moving up the scale of Holon partons. Cells, which are made of molecules, which are made of atoms, 
and all of which are fractal holon partons, they have different rules or laws or rules of the game and different possible moves. So the things that a cell can do are different from the things a molecule can do, which again are different from the things atoms can do. But these things are going on all the time. Anyway, so again, we have agency and structure. And all those objects, fractal whole and partons, atoms, molecules, cells, organs, organisms, societies, nations, the whole planet has different levels, emergent levels of structure. So the things they can do, the possible moves, and then intentional systems have agency or choices or decisions they can make using their free will. Provided they know the choices they're making, of course. If you don't think you have a choice, maybe you only just do one thing. But if you have all the information and all the possible alternatives, then uh, you can make an informed choice. And this is why information science is important. Perfect information is perfect knowledge. Humans don't have it. We have bounded rationality, as Gerd Geigerenzo likes to say, and uh, people like Herbert Simon. So anyway, what would help is an ethicizer that knows all and sees all and can advise us on the best and most ethical decisions or choices to make. And likewise punish us if we make unethical decisions with graduated sanctions, possibly even using Ostrom's core design principles. Yeah. Next. So you have these three laws of fractal whole on partons going all the way up and multi-level selection going all the way up here from, I've left off molecules and atoms and quarks and things, but we start down the bottom with cells on that big diagram on the left. They make up or integrate upwards into tissues. They integrate upwards into organs. They cooperate and integrate upwards into organ systems. They integrate upwards into a larger system, a person or an organism. They integrate upwards into a family unit or not. Sometimes you ditch your family and go find friends who are like your family. So families are sometimes voluntary rather than biological. Anyway, then you have local communities, cities, towns or villages, depending on the scale size, uh, states or provinces if you're over in China, um, a country, a continent, a planet, a star system, a galaxy, the Milky Way, for example, a galactic cluster, galactic supercluster, supercluster complex. These are all fractal whole on partons. They're a whole and a part at the same time. And those are parts of a universe such as ours. And if you take this to its logical conclusion, why would the three laws of fractal whole on partons and the units stop at a universe? There's probably a multiverse, a whole lot of universes, probably inside a simulation. And if not now, then definitely when we build the ethicizer to show us how to live ethically and in peace and harmony on Earth. Uh, so anyway, you have agency and structure all the way up there. So newly emergent properties, newly emergent rules and laws and newly emergent possible moves of the units in each case or the systems. So there's that. That may have far reaching philosophical and scientific implications. Who can say? Maybe read those five chapters and decide for yourself. Next. So yes, we can zoom in a bit closer and see those cells, tissues, organs. These are levels of the fractal whole on parton. Each of these things are based the three laws on that scale level. And so they all have different agency, levels of agency and structure. So you can pick three things at random there, or you can pick all of them and go through examining closely what are the structures, laws or rules of this entity and what are the possible moves or if it has intentional agency choices or decisions that it could make. And of course, actions have consequences. So 
we may be able to make choices, but then we also probably have to deal with the consequences. But some of us have to deal with the consequences of actions by others, and that's why we probably need the ethicizer to keep an eye on those people who aren't terribly ethical. Next. So that's why we should build the ethicizer to live in an ethical world. There's a link down below if you want to read more. There's two articles on the line about that. The ethicizer. A initially a game, then a mobile phone smart app, then deployed worldwide. That way everyone can have input. All eight billion human animals or humans in the world can have input into the ethicizer. Get some great ethical and moral philosophers throwing in a few good ideas. Then you test them all. And if it works, keep it, which is the basic premise of evolutionary epistemology. And if it works better than the current one you're using, use that and put the other one in storage or remember it for later in case you need it for a different problem. Next. So now we can make the ethicizer because of EvCult, because of the three laws of fractal holon partons and the structure of units of culture and biology, physics, chemistry, everything. We need to really get some better system than flawed human animals, flawed humans, sorry, to uh, run the world, basically, and ensure, minimize suffering for all, including plants and animals. A whole earth ethic. Next, what's this? What is evolutionary philosophy? Oh yeah, about time we got round to this. So that was the new meta, meta science of Ev Cult and one of the proposals, which is the ethicizer. And by the way, we should build thousands of ethicizers. All the game companies in the world should build them. I used to make games for a living. We should build lots of them, then have an ethicizer Olympics to find the most ethical ethicizer. And then we should turn the ethicizer on itself to make sure that it's being ethical. Anyway, bit of a strange loop. <coughs> Excuse you. <coughs> Look out. There's a war on science. <clears throat> it's a crazy world. Um, what is EvPhil? Good question. Next. Yeah, some examples. I already went through this in the introduction, so I don't think I'll go too deep into it now. Next. It's a domain of philosophy informed by evolutionary science. And this discovery of EvCult those four things, units, levels, evolutionary mechanisms, and three laws of culture, are the latest contributions from information and communication science and creativity science and applied evolutionary epistemology, all those different subdomains that uh, system science, all those things that make up EvCult. And many scholars in Ev philosophy, as I say, I've got a blog post on a towards a Wikipedia page on EvPhil, just because it'd be handy to have a great long list of a bibliography, really. So us evolution fans can uh, dig deep if and when we need to. And plus all those people should be advising on the ethicizer or lots of different ethicizers and then see which one works the best. And you run all these different ethicizers to find out which one is the most ethical one. So uh, I shouldn't be involved because <coughs> everyone will think I have an agenda. I don't. I think one world, one planet, one people, please, and less suffering. So there's the idea. Go through a process and make it a product or lots of them and then use the best one to run the world. That's my suggestion. I also like Isaac Asimov's story from uh, 1950 the evitable conflict, but I digress. Next, that's what EvPhil is, informed by EvScience, including EvCult, hopefully. Popper said this, we're not students of some subject matter, but students of problems, and problems may cut right across the border of any subject matter or discipline. So that's why EvCult's handy, because it uses the same universal set of units, levels, evolutionary mechanisms, and three laws through every domain, physics, chemistry, biology, math, science, the arts, social science, engineering, chemistry, whatever you have, whatever you want. 
It's all the one thing. Ugh. I am so sick of this war on science. Ugh. It's just really frustrating. Ugh. The war on science continues. But anyway, uh, another great thing Popper said, our main concern in philosophy and science should be the search for truth. It's just a good point, really. And that's where a lot of continental philosophy just goes off the rails because it's a lot. It's not even wrong. It's uh, quite annoying. Pierre Bourdieu is the only continental theorist I like pretty much. Can't stand the postmodernists and Foucault, Michel Foucault, that is, not the pendulum guy. He was a scientist. He's good. Um, yeah, so I'm pro-science and I do not like science denial. But that's just me. I'm a scientist. <coughs> anyway, next. Yeah, anyway, there's a blog post there, that link. See also the YouTube description down below. Next. He's still talking about Ev Phil. That's what that is. Here's another big quote, or a couple of quotes by Popper from Conjectures and Refutations. Uh, you can read, freeze the PowerPoint, uh, freeze the YouTube video and read that if, if you like, but in the nutshell, genuine philosophical problems are rooted in urgent problems outside philosophy, not these language games of Wittgenstein, and they die if these roots decay. That's what's gone wrong with a lot of philosophy. And uh, if you want to understand a philosopher, such as Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, or anyone really, Irvin Leslow, first look at what their problem was and what they were reacting to. Otherwise, you don't really have a good context. So what was the problem they're solving or which philosopher did they read and not like their solution? Whether it's Hume with the is ought problem and Hume's guillotine or whatever it may be. Uh, what problem were they reacting to or trying to solve? And were there any empirical scientific questions we can pull out of what they said and then go test them in the real world? Next. Oh yeah, more on that post there. And here's another one. Popper talks about what science is. It's a four-step method. You have a problem or a difficulty or a goal. Then you have an expectation about how to solve it, known as a theory or hypothesis or a wild guess. Then you have to try it out. You've got to suck it and see, do an experimental test via trial and error, and then if needed, do error correction. So I actually think all of life is doing science because it's pretty much nothing we ever do that doesn't have an expectation. We expect this will happen if I do that. So every time you expect anything, you then have to test if that's how it's going to go. So most of this slips below conscious awareness. Anyway, next. More on that post. So here's a saying I just made up now. Trust the science, not the scientist. Trust the art, not the artist. The writing, not the writer. The game, not the game designer. And the philosophy, not the philosopher. I'm not into gurus. I mean, I... There's a lot of philosophy I like, but I don't agree with everything that any one single philosopher said, probably. That's just me. As for science, well, it keeps updating automatically because scientists keep testing science and testing hypotheses. Next. Uh, oh, yeah, so this is just some of the headings from that Wikipedia article I proposed. So someone should throw it up on... Wikipedia, a page on Ev Phil. It'll help a lot of evolutionary philosophers, I think. Those are just some of the topic headings. I am busy doing my science and finishing a million word book on Ev Cult, so I don't really have time to get too stuck into philosophy, but I love hearing Ev philosophy. Um, it can shed new light on what I'm trying to do in science. Evolutionary science. Next. Again, there's a link. So, there we have it. What are the implications for Ev Phil? Yes, now that we've covered what Ev Cult is and what Ev Phil is, now let's look at some of the implications, at least some that I've come up with. I'm sure you've got plenty more. 
or better ones or both. Next. So a recap, EvCult is a new meta-meta-science, all-disciplinary matrix, a single one-size-fits-all set of scientific units, levels, evolutionary algorithms, also known as evolutionary mechanisms. Thanks again to applied evolutionary epistemology, Natalie Gontier and many other great theorists at Appeal and scientists, and three laws. So those four things uh, is EvCult in a nutshell. Uh, of all culture and biology and physics and chemistry and everything, but whatever. Systems and units of culture are what we're talking about. Fractal, whole one, partons and the three laws. And the, your algorithms like BVSR, ST, SVT. Over in biology, it's generally looked on as uh, selection, variation, and heredity. Um, but that's S, well, or variation, and then selection, and then heredity or transmission. But if you zoom in a bit closer and look at the fractals, there's a few other algorithms going on as well. So you might select a word, vary it, and then repeat it to somebody else. But are you repeating it if you've changed it? This is the question. Um, and is it better or worse than the original? Interesting questions. Next. And yes, as I say, EvCult means we can now make the ethicizer because we know what the units and levels are, and the mechanisms, and uh, the three laws. So why not model the earth and all the people, plants and animals and everything in it, and all the products, the cars and the cities and the birds and whatever, and um, make sure we can minimize suffering. And we'll get to that next. So yeah, the ethicizer keeps in mind monitoring all those levels and units all the time, seeing who's being ethical and who's not, and uh, gives a tap on the shoulder to those who aren't being ethical or are causing suffering or problems for the whole world. So yeah. We have the all-seeing eye of the ethicizer. You can make it a religion if you want and worship the ethicizer as an AI god walking the earth. You'd have four separate quantum computers because if one breaks down, the other three can outvote it, etc. If one makes a mistake or has a bit flipped by a neutrino or something. Anyway, next. So yeah, this is a, the knowledge pyramid from information science. Data down the bottom gets processed into information, processed more into knowledge, processed more into understanding, processed more hopefully into wisdom, choosing the right thing to do and how to solve global wicked problems such as inequality, poverty, pollution, environmental degradation, destruction of ecosystems, um, wars and suffering, crimes, etc. Anyway, up top of that, you have the ethicizer who is good at doing all those things and much quicker than a human who can probably be bribed <coughs> or blackmailed. Uh, next. So phase one of the ethicizer is a game that everyone can play and they can have a go at running the world as one unit, one cooperative unit. And you'll soon find out just how bad a human is at doing that because it's hard to monitor eight billion people or 7.6 billion people at once and make sure they're all happy and not suffering and not doing wrong to each other or, or to the planet. Uh, so anyway, a fun game and everyone should make this game. I'm giving the, away, uh, the idea away for free. <coughs> I'd like to see lots of game companies make this game, uh, an ethicizer, like, you know, those global government games or like The Sims, etc. I've done a game design for it, but do your own by all means. And uh, yeah, people should enjoy playing ruler of the earth and they'll soon find out they have an ethicizer in the game who is a mentor advising them. Oh, well, here's what you did wrong there. These people are still suffering and you need to try something else. Or you can just hand it over to the computer to run and you'll soon find out an ethicizer would do a much better job of running the world than you would as a flawed, slow thinking human animal. I mean human animal, I mean human, sorry. Next, so phase one, there's three phases. Phase one is the game, which is, you know, on computers or 
web browsers or mobile phones, whatever you like, any, any, any and every platform. Play the game of the ethicizer, and you can also give feedback on it. So you say, oh, the thing I didn't like about the game was it was designed like this, and that would feed into designing the proper ethicizer, the, the big one that runs the world. So you, you sort of test it out before you deploy it. Anyway, then it can be a mobile phone app where you could ask your phone anything, or when you go to the supermarket, you're about to buy something, it could tell you what the most ethical brand of that product was and give you a, an alarm error message saying, whoops, you're buying the least ethical breakfast cereal, you might want to try this other one, it's more ethical, and here's the scientific reasons why. Um, <clears throat> Or just you should you could ask who should I marry and it would know who you're perfectly matched with because every person is apparently perfectly matched with about 170 other people in the world. Uh, so the ethicizer could be a dating app and find those people for you and make sure you don't have a troubled marriage um, or whatever. Uh, next, so phase one is the game. Phase two is the app, the ethicizer app in your smartphone, which keeps an eye on your ethics. It keeps a score and uh, <coughs> gives you some good advice on how to do more ethical decisions in your life. In fact, it saves you thinking and worrying about a lot of things in the same way that recommender algorithms on Netflix or Amazon or even Google do better than humans can do, as uh, the great evolutionary historian and evolutionary futurist Yuval Noah Harari has pointed out in Homo Deus, great book, and 21 Lessons, another great book, and Sapiens, another great book, Evolutionary History. Uh, basically, you need to know yourself better than the algorithms, but you probably can't, so let's have an ethical algorithm that's helping you make the right decisions. And of course, you still have your free will, you can do the wrong thing, but it will check your ethical score. So I think you get points. A bit like China's social credit system, but it's run by flawed humans, sorry about that. Um, but if you had a super ethical algorithm, deciding what's best for you as a person and you as a planet, as part of a planet. Uh, I think we'd be better off all having that information, don't you? Anyway, next, phase one is the game. Phase two is the smartphone app. And uh, phase three is worldwide deployment. Here's some parts of the whole. You've got your mobile phone. You've got your Google glasses, perhaps. Um, You've got your body camera, so it's keeping an eye on what you're doing at all times. We sacrifice a bit of privacy for an ethical world. Um, try the game first, see if you like it. Um, compare it to your real life and make your own decision. Um, you have a bio bracelet which monitors things about you. I mean, if these companies, which corporations are usually psychopaths, um, unless they're B corporations, but even then there's a few problems. Um, basically, if this information is going to be used by someone, it may as well be used by the ethicizer and not corporations which are psychopaths. Um, and you also have cameras everywhere, including cameras on little drones, number five there. So the ethicizer sees all and knows all. And then if somebody does something unethical, uh, one of those slaughter bots down the bottom, a little machine gun on a drone, turns up, gives you three warnings. So first it turns up with no bullets in the gun and says, next time I'm coming back with bullets. Second time it has bullets in the gun. And the third time you sort of, well, you don't want a third time really. You want to have two warnings and then change your behavior. Um, the ethicizer will send you many alarms. Um, but if somebody is truly evil, like a Hitler or fascists like that, that uh, some of whom seem to have popped up as presidents of certain countries lately, um, I think you would want them to be eliminated because they're kind of, well, maybe not the people, but who knows? That's up for, that's to the ethicizer, that's for the ethicizer to decide, not me. That's what I'm saying is I don't want to make these decisions. I want a super ethical algorithm to use all the perfect information and then explain why it's doing what it's doing. So it's self-explaining AI. Um, Look into Bostrom and the Tegmark and the Future of Life Institute. Life 3.0 is a good book by Tegmark. Anyway, yeah, you uh, want the ethicizer making these global decisions because uh, us humans aren't good at thinking. As Miller pointed out in the 50s, you know, the magical number seven plus or minus two. Uh, Pinker notes rightly, we're good at thinking of about three things at once, us human animals, humans, I mean. 
Um, <coughs> but computers can think about millions of things at once and use maths to solve problems. Uh, so yeah, turn all these things into empirical scientific problems and have a computer solve them. Probably a quantum computer. But anyway, uh, there you go. No more of this uh, corporate crime <clears throat> and unethical behaviour by companies polluting and ripping people off and ripping the world off and destroying everything. Um, just an idea, just an idea. Um, I don't have a dog in the race. I'll probably be dead soon anyway. Um, but just putting a good idea out there for the rest of the world to pick up and run with if they think it's a good idea. Um, also, you don't want this to fall into the wrong hands because if somebody evil, well, that's not good. Uh, next, so some philosophical questions solved by the ethicizer, thanks to the meta meta science of Ev Cult. Those units, levels, mechanisms, and three laws. I've been through all these in the introduction, so I won't go through them again. Good. And a few more. Again, I went through them in the introduction. So there's that. You can freeze the YouTube video if you want to think about that some more. And more on that blog post there. Yeah, so some scientific solutions, by the way, that fall out of EvCult. Um, don't forget, units of culture and systems are structured as fractal holon partons and obey the three laws of holon partons in both biology and culture. So this helps with the philosophy of mind or consciousness. So see fractal holon partons and the three laws. This helps Dan Dennett and David Chalmers and a lot of these philosophers of mind out. Once you understand the building blocks, you can see how self-coupled systems and systems with homeostats um, can become conscious. And I'm not a panpsychist, but this is what needs investigating with these new tools of EvCult. Um, it's wide open and jump in with the tools and start solving problems, I say. And we also want to know that we're not creating hells and populating them because I've made a lot of video games with little AIs in them. I often wonder, are they conscious? Are they suffering? Um, be good to get to the bottom of all that so that we're not causing unnecessary suffering. And this also solves a lot of problems in philosophy of language. For some reason, a lot of linguists have missed the three laws and the structure of language, fractal, whole, and partons. So a letter, a word, sorry, a letter, a morpheme or a syllable, a word, a phrase, a clause, a sentence, a paragraph, a discourse, etc. They missed it. Anyway, this solves a hell of a lot of problems and helps out Chomsky and Pinker um, with a lot of language questions, that whole universal grammar problem. Um, units of culture, whether it's language or music or science or technology, you know, well, all units of culture are tools for solving problems. So all units of culture are, strictly speaking, technology, whether it's a word or a language or a song or a spatula or a microscope or a telescope. They're all tools uh, or a car um, or a computer. They're all tools for solving problems, for achieving goals. So they're all technology. Anyway, see my encyclopedia article in Encyclopedia of Creativity 2020 for more on that. Anyway, this solves a lot of problems, uh, answers a lot of scientific questions. So have at it. Next. Oh yeah, compare the three laws of fractal holon partons with Newton's laws as well. It's just an interesting exercise. Next. Oh, more on that post there, down the bottom. Linked in the description, probably. As two of my heroes once said, that. Who were they? Gandhi and Lynn Margulis. I love her endosymbiosis. Combine two old things to get a new thing and it works better than the competition. So if you have two prokaryotes, single-celled organisms or systems, and you combine them, you get a cell with a nucleus or a eukaryote. This is a major transition in evolution and all the major transitions turn out to be explained by this kind of thing. Fractal holon partons combining combine two or more old things to get a new thing and it works better than the competition. So, or the available alternatives in the environment. 
So, uh, yeah, creativity works the same way in biology and culture, combining things to get a resulting unit that functions better than the competing alternatives. Uh, anyway, I've written on that too in uh, my article on the Robo Raconteur and other places. <coughs> Next. Oh, for more, see Heroism Science. Um, there's a blog post on that there, started up a few years ago, just using Joe Campbell's work, the monomyth or hero's journey, uh, using that to applications of leadership. After all, scientists and firefighters and first responders, nurses, etc., they're the real heroes, um, helping other people, pro-social, trying to make the world a better place trying to leave the world a better place than they found it, etc. Um, yeah, heroism science, well worth a look. I still say that uh, all life is doing science because we all do the scientific method every day, just not necessarily wearing a white lab coat. Um, we all have problems or goals, and then we have expectations, how to fix this particular problem. Then we have to test it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes you've got to do error correction and clean up your mess. Anyway, moving along. By the way, it's no fun being a hero. I would not advise it, and I'm not saying I am one. But extremely creative people like Einstein, Newton, Darwin are heroes because they solve a problem and they bring that back to the community, which is basically the 12 or 18 or 33 steps of the hero's journey or the four-step method of science as per Popper. Next. Anyway, there's my five scientific book chapters on Ev Cult from 2016, the appendix in my PhD, through two encyclopedia articles to 2020, and now I've got this million word book on the way, a couple of years away yet. Um, I've been writing it since 2016, but in fact, I've been writing it for 30 years. Long story. Um, Highly recommend those five chapters. If you know me, you can write to me and perhaps I could share some or all of them with you academically. Next. Yeah. Anyway, more information on the EvCult blog. And on the EvCult blog, there's this series of seven or eight articles, uh, which is an introduction. Um, might be worth reading sometime. Next. And, yeah, since the NARIM or unit of story, unit of narrative, is also structured as a fractal holon parton, as are all units of culture, you can analyse movie scripts for their units of story and you can analyse movies for their units of story on different scale levels, whether it's the whole movie or acts or sequences of scenes or scenes or shots or moments or still images or pixels, what have you. And the different communication channels that are within a film, whether it's image, sound, music, language, etc. Next. And uh, yeah, if you like, you can read my PhD for free. It's online at that link. Um, 350 pages of Ev Cult study of 40 movies and includes the storiality theory. Next. So that is Ev Cult's implications for Ev Phil in a nutshell. Enjoy. Ah, and yeah, what are the implications? I don't know, you tell me. This is a call to action or adventure. I'm sure you've got more and better ideas. So please, jump in. So who was that guy? Velikovsky of Newcastle. Uh, all that stuff. But basically just evolutionary culturologist. Me. Good. A recap. Ah, yeah. Do a test. Do you now see how Evcult achieves or solves, for example, consilience, the unity of all knowledge? That's a yes or no question. If not, Maybe watch this again or read those five chapters of mine and the blog. Uh, you see how it defines, actually identifies 
units of culture and culture is information because there's information, energy and matter, three different substrates. So that's a yes or no too. Do you see how it shows the structure of all culture and how it enables building the ethicizer for an ethical world and which I think philosophers should all have input into. So play the game or write articles on what the ethicizer should do and how it should do it. Uh, because this is, well, these are all problems, sub-problems that need to be solved in the most ethical way. And then, of course, you build a bunch of ethicizers and test them against each other and see which worlds are the happiest and have the least suffering and most well-being. You know, turn these things into mathematical questions. You know, Sam Harris, the moral landscape, etc., etc. Um, ethical altruism, Peter Singer, Mike Brady, you know, Etc. Etc. Do you also see how EvCult is a meta meta science? So there's individual sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, etc. Then there's meta sciences like system science or creativity science because it examines all those things. And then one level above is EvCult because it simplifies uh, systems and units of culture to fractal holon partons and the three laws and then looks at the evolutionary algorithms that are operating on them due to people and their intentional agency or robots doing things with them or just uh, the natural environment in a state of nature. So you have your four different kinds of selection, natural selection where the environment does the <laughs> deciding uh, who lives and dies and gets to breed. Uh, then you have your artificial or methodical, your sexual selection and your unconscious selection. Anyway, let's not go too deep right now. Um, you see how it solves 50 hard scientific problems of culture. Anyway, there's that blog post that lists those quotes, 50 quotes. Uh, people trying to just basically ask what is culture and how does it work? Uh, I think this solves all that or at least it's a new platform, a higher platform to work from than we've had before. And you see how it integrates values into science. So we should live in a moral, moral and ethical world and the ethicize is one way to do that. Otherwise, we're just leaving it up to people, which is, you know, you've got to start somewhere. People can try hard, but you sort of need a top-down, bigger organising uh, procedure or algorithm or method and computers are good at doing things that humans aren't. So why not give them a crack? Try it first as a sim, do it as a game or lots of games, then see how people like it as a smartphone app and then phase three, once it's all working perfectly and ethically, deploy it worldwide. And we wouldn't have to spend any more money on military or defence because there'd be no more nuclear threats. The ethicizer wouldn't allow that and we don't need to go to war on each other anymore. Just one big ethical happy world. It's a beautiful idea, a utopia. I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime, but I think my lifetime's going to end sometime pretty soon anyway. But this is my gift to whoever is watching this out there. Uh, and also, do you see how EvCult applies to all other sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, that's just a quick test to see if you have grokked EvCult. If not, maybe read those five chapters and the blog post and this book whenever it happens. Uh, do you also see how it makes even the arts and humanities a science? Because paintings, films, songs, poems, everything, sculptures, you know, ideas, processes and products, they're all units of culture and they're all fractal whole and partons governed by the three laws. So, yeah, hope that helps. And I hope you find it interesting and useful and thought-provoking. Next. More on... The EvCult blog, or which is not EvCult for dummies, it's EvCult for smart people with no time. More on, more on my transmedia writing blog. Oh, there's a blog post about philosopher AI, which of course would feed into ideas in the ethicizer. Next, if you want, you could even look at my Flash Philosophy Fiction weblog where I write philosophy informed short stories but a warning there's some crazy ideas in there that even I don't agree with even though I wrote them but you have to get the ideas out and then see if you like them and so yeah I don't necessarily approve of everything that's on my 
PH3 blog, but it was interesting to think it and say it and then see what other people think and say too, because usually I totally agree. Next. Yeah, there's those five chapters. Just read those three if you can only read three chapters, the two encyclopedia articles and uh, the original and best. Um, next. Yeah, thank you for watching and hearing and reading via three communication channels if you had the subtitles on. Uh, Ev Cult's implications for Ev Phil. It's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful. Let's do this again. Then again, I've been talking about this for seven years and it's not quite as interesting as it once was. But I'd love to see somebody take a crack at some of these issues. Um, that's what happens probably when you combine Ev Cult with Ev Phil and see what the implications are. Don't forget to, uh, by me, don't forget to uh, Google in Terabang. The universal algorithm for creativity combine two old things to get a new thing and it works better than the available alternatives. Um, so a creative artifact is new, useful and surprising. Enjoy doing creativity. Thank you so much. Good night.